Hello to everyone. I hope you can hear me. And we are about to commence our event today. I'm Dr. Julie Byrne, Hartman Chair of Catholic Studies and Chair of the Department of Religion and Jewish Studies at Hofstra University in Long Island, New York. Today, we are honored to be joined by two experts, Megan Goodwin, Dr. Megan Goodwin of Northeastern University and New York Times reporter, Elizabeth Diaz to discuss QAnon, the Capitol insurrection and the Biden inauguration. On behalf of my colleagues in religion and Jewish studies, I want to welcome all our students, staff, faculty and community members all across the world to this event. Thank you for joining us. More thank yous are in order. First to our two speakers whom I will introduce in a moment. Thank you also to our co-sponsors for this event, the Jewish Studies Program, the Hofstra University Honors College, the Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Department of Sociology and the Program in Criminology, the Department of History, the Department of Political Science, the Writing Studies Program, and the Hofstra Cultural Center. For students at Hofstra, registration for the fall semester is coming up soon. If you like what you see today, this is what we do in the Department of Religion. Critical takes on topics having to do with religion and all the ways religion interweaves with social and historical realities. So think about taking a religion or Jewish studies class. And those courses in religion also pair beautifully with courses offered by all our co-sponsoring departments in SOCH, CRIM, poli sci, history, writing studies, and more. So I'd be happy to talk with anyone later about your fall registration plans. For everyone, here's the technical part of this introduction. We are a lot of people here on Zoom. And for efficiency, we will not be taking any direct questions. Please put your questions in chat. And please, if you can, specify to whom your question is directed, to Elizabeth Diaz or Megan Goodwin. My colleague, Dr. Santiago Slobodsky and I will gather the questions and ask them on behalf of the audience, giving priority to questions from students. And now to introduce our featured guests. Ms. Elizabeth Diaz covers faith and politics for the New York Times from the Washington Bureau. She previously covered a similar beat for Time Magazine reporting on both the 2012 and 2016 presidential campaigns. She has interviewed Pope Francis and the Dalai Lama, while also covering social and ideological shifting sands, such as the way the Latinx community is changing US evangelicalism and our culture's collective reckoning in movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too. Elizabeth is regularly cited by scholars and journalists alike as one of the country's most incisive analysts of US religion working today. She has an undergraduate degree in theology from Wheaton College in Illinois and a master's degree from Princeton Theological Seminary. Professor Megan Goodwin is the program director of Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation funded project hosted by Northeastern University in Boston that promotes public scholarship on religion. Her first book, Abusing Religion, Literary Persecution, Sex Scandals, and American Minority Religions is now available through Rutgers University Press. With Professor Elise Morgenstein Fuerst, she co-hosts the podcast, Keeping It 101, A Killjoy's Introduction to Religion. Her current book project looks at why Americans love to call groups and behaviors they don't like cults. Her undergraduate degree from Boston University was in print journalism and her PhD in religious studies is from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And the reason why I give these, uh, these wonderful speakers undergraduate degrees 
um, information is because is because it's great for our undergraduates to see how you can major in religion and become a journalist. You can major in journalism and become a religious studies professor. And lots of different things can happen on uh, the course of one's life from your undergraduate start at many locations. So thank you again to both of our speakers for being here. We have before us this um, topic of the phenomenon of Q. And uh, I wanted first to get some real basics down by asking Megan a question. And, um, and that is just, what is QAnon? But then also, why is knowing what Q is not necessarily proof against Q thought and knowing what QAnon members believe might not really get to the heart of how the movement functions. There we go. Sorry, I, I don't Zoom very often, so bear with me. Thank you all for having me. Before I say anything else, I want to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded territory of the Akosisko and Wamanaki people. And I mention this not just because it is true and important, but also because uh, in a conversation about religion, I think it's really important to acknowledge whose religious freedom, whose religious rights get taken seriously by the United States or what's now the United States and whose don't. So the quote unquote QAnon shaman, I'm sure you saw the picture, is currently incarcerated and being fed organic lettuce because of his religion, which has been uh, explained to the judge based on Wikipedia but actually incarcerated Native folks and other uh, folks from marginalized religious backgrounds don't get that kind of treatment. So if you want to push it past the land acknowledgement statement and, and really hopefully get into the heart of why this matters. So the basic question is, what is Q? Q is a giant hot mess. Uh, the, the movement gets started in some of the seedier corners of the internet. Uh, it shows up on 4chan and then on 8chan. It's it's a big nebulous conspiracy theory based on the suspicion that someone close to Trump's administration was uh, providing secret insights into the government's real plans to you know, purify the land and make America, you know, you know the rest. Um, so we saw one of the earliest kind of national public attentions around what would become QAnon with Pizzagate uh, in 2015, 2016, where folks were convinced that uh, Democrats were trafficking children through the a, a number of pizza places, including a pizza place in uh, DC for uh, purposes of, of sexual defilement, predation, commodification. Um, so basically, as a whole, Democrats are child sex traffickers, and this basement in this pizza place in DC is where they're moving the kids from. Um, so the Comet Ping Pong Pizza place doesn't actually have a basement. Um, but a dude drove up from the American South, shot up the pizza place. They still, to this day, get harassing calls. And when I was writing my book, I included a, a, one paragraph about Pizzagate because it connected to earlier uh, an earlier fear about child sex trafficking and other defilement of children in the satanic panic, the 1980s. And I thought, no one will remember this. I can't believe I'm going to include this. And my book came out in July. And this is my, I lost track, but this is my double, like I'm in double digits talking about Q now. So they have strengthened, they have, ah, become more prominent, um, we're going to have a conversation about, I think, how we think about Q, because Julie, one of the things that you said is, you know, why is thinking about Q in terms of belief maybe not the way to do it? And I think that's really important. Um, there's a ton of headlines circling now about, like, do they really believe this? Do they not really believe this? And the argument that I and a number of other people have made is that it kind of doesn't matter if people believe it. We see politicians capitalizing on it. We see people acting on this theory. So whether or not they believe it, not the most important question. And for folks considering religious studies classes, I will say, one of the cool things about studying religion is you see this disconnect between what people say they believe and how people act. And the study of religion honestly is so much more interested in what people do. And that's this. So 
lots more to say there, but that's, I think, a good place to start. Very much so. Thank you so much. And and um, that's a just you know what Q is for people who might not be familiar, and just segueing into the fact that Q might not be most helpfully discussed as the list of things that Q and non people believe, but their enmeshment in you know a larger cultural context some of the historical contexts that you just gave um uh megan and and that elizabeth can also fill in because elizabeth your reporting really has focused on um the way in which q intersects with so much else that's going on and as we saw the um, symbol of Q show up in the Capitol insurrection, of course, that was only one of the numerous groups and numerous sets of beliefs that are all intersecting. When you look at the landscape that involves Q, Elizabeth, what do you find is most important to most important to understand or crucial to see about the context of the Q phenomenon. Julie, thank you so much for having me and Megan for this conversation. And quick plug, loved studying religion undergrad, went on to do it in grad school too. So Megan nerd factor, but um, <laughs> my plug for you. So I have covered religion for about 10 years. And um, in the last five, you know, with the rise of former President Trump to power, with the uh, millions and millions of conservative Christians who supported him um, from the very beginning. And I, you know, I, I've been thinking about this progression of like, where have we come, like, what is the big picture of where we've come from? How did we get to the attack um, on the Capitol on January 6th. Um, I'm in Washington, Capitol's not too far away. Uh, and I have interviewed, you know, I can't even, I, I wonder, I can't even begin to think how many conservative Christians I've interviewed in the last five years all across the country. And when I was, when, when you know, the news report started coming in, my colleagues were at the Capitol that day and we started to realize something was going very badly. This was getting very violent. This was um, something completely different than we had expected. I started making these calls again, just to see, you know, who I'm, who, who was there, who could I interview, who was there. Uh, and, you know, these conservative Christian groups were among the many that had shown up that day. Uh, and what was interesting to me, um, from the beginning doing those calls, you know, from people who were there on the mall, people who went inside, um, people back home, you know, family members of folks who had participated who were back home. Um, these, the, these Q theories and conspiracy theories and ideas that we've been hearing about for the last several years um, that seemed more fringe suddenly it was immediately clear to me that this was every it, the it, this was so mainstream and it was more than just q um like julie was saying i mean the the folks who participated in the siege and also who maybe didn't go inside but were part of the events um on the mall we saw you know um overt Q supporters, we saw other kinds of conspiracy theorists, we saw groups like the Proud Boys, other white nationalist groups, we saw um, various, you know, incarnations of the modern clan, we saw church groups, um, we saw all kinds of signs, and it was all like, um, we saw the Confederate flags, we saw Christian style flags, we saw Bible verses, um, and it was immediately there was a dude that was dressed up like Captain Verona. Yeah, yeah, it was it was all of this, and it was clear that this was one big interwoven mess of a thing. Like this was no longer just these specific different groups, but it was how this was coming together, 
um, into this cultural force that we needed to pay attention to. So I felt like, I mean, I, I was, I was, I remember talking to one woman, I'm trying to remember where she drove up from um, to participate in this uh, on the mall. And she was, I realized she was basically, it was like interviewing someone on a different planet. Like we are in such a, we've talked about how we're in a divided country, but I think we're in even a new space beyond that where millions of Americans are operating in one set of what is real and millions of other Americans are operating on a set of uh, something that else is real. I mean, and, and for me reporting it, you know, where I'm used to, uh, for, for lack of a better analogy, it's like one planet we're used to the norms of physics, like how it works. This planet has gravity, you know, you put a, something at the top of the hill and it will roll down, but the, it's not operating like that on another planet. And we don't even know what those rules are. It's not just that we don't understand the ideas of what's going on. It's that we need to begin to really take a hard look at the principles that aren't even making any of this happen. Um, and I think that, that that is this question of how does delusion work? Um, how do people get caught up in things that are not real? I mean, we're just really beyond fake news. Uh, at this point, it's just something completely different. And so I've been um, trying to understand that more in the reporting um, because you just can't understand any of this in isolation anymore. I don't, I don't think it's going to work. Um, it's all bound up in you know, apocalyptic movements that are happening now. Um, what, what is the effect of us all having been in quarantine for a year without the normal kinds of just low level social, um, different kinds of social engagement that might challenge some of these um, unfounded ideas. Uh, people are really searching. So much of the country is desperate. It's an economic crisis, it's a political crisis, social crisis spiritual awakening is happening. Um, so I, I want us to, you know, as we start talking about this today, think about it, maybe not as something that's extreme, but what is mainstream here um, in the country. It's sobering, but I couldn't agree more. And it's very, very noticeable looking at both the scholarship that's emerging as well as the on the ground reporting about QAnon and allied movements, that it is mainstream. Mm. And that this is um, not a phenomenon of any particular social class, um, age, quadrant of the country, gender. It is actually gender. I meant to mention that before. The thing that I learned from Jeff Charlotte is that who's doing, by the way, great reporting on Q, particularly for Vanity Fair, is that most Qs are actually women. Um, that is not the presence that we see on the mall. That is not certainly the image that we're given of Q in public, but overwhelmingly the folks who are publicly identifying as Q uh, cues, I guess, uh, are women, and a lot of them get involved in this through conversations and concerns about child sex trafficking. So a huge presence of um, Mormon women, Catholic women, who show up for these like anti-trafficking events. And by the time they're done, they're like marching along doing the where we go one, where we go, you know, where we go one, we go all. I would be a bad cue. Um, but yeah, no, it was, I was really surprised at the, the gender marker in a way that like, yeah, the, all economic classes, uh, it's still a mostly white movement, but there is representation from folks of other races and ethnicities, but this gender piece was really interesting. And last plug, Melissa Gira Grant is doing some really amazing work for New Republic around uh, the, the gender and sexuality of folks attracted to Q. That's fascinating. And I did pick that up along the way that there was this gender component about um, pl playing on, playing to, or syncing with the um, uh, a um, you know women and family concern that might be at least in traditional terms more taken up by women, and of course the reality of uh, the world is that 
actual child sex abuse and actual human trafficking is an incredible problem of which we were, are becoming all the more aware. Um, and so there's a, a, a dovetailing of what Q sparks concern about, namely that a liberal cabal of elites is practicing human trafficking and preying on children. And if you are concerned about children, you will get involved in Q. Yeah. With the reality of a, a still arguably underattended um, phenomenon of, of, of sex abuse uh, across all populations. Yeah, I just, I also wanna interject because I don't know how familiar folks are with the literature around trafficking, but most of the, most of the conversation that happens around trafficking in mainstream media, if we can use that phrase, uh, doesn't represent the reality of, of trafficking. Most trafficking is around labor, not around sex. And most of the child sex abuse that happens is not trafficking abuse. It's happening in our homes and our communities, right? So it is staggering to see the kind of out turning out around Q and uh, things like Operation Underground Railroad, uh, which is specifically an anti-sex, an anti-child sex trafficking organization that has not done anything to prevent child sex abuse or child sex trafficking. Uh, the funders of a lot of these organizations are themselves now facing accusations of uh, proximity to child porn. Um, and yeah, it's just you know, not that we should expect the administration of the former president to have followed through on anything, but prosecution of sex trafficking actually went way down in the last four years. I mean, to say nothing of like appearing in public with uh, known child sex traffickers like, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, so. And, um, and one thing that really comes to the fore with uh, the concerns of of Q about both women who are believers in Q who are concerned about children and all members of Q who are concerned about the United States and who is attacking the United States is that it features um, tremendous anxiety and fear about um, the kind of America that would not be um, and is not headed toward a version that is white supremacist and patriarchal and, and quote traditional family values. And so, you know, there are, there are real concerns among cures as among most of Americans about where it's headed, but there are patterns of particularity about who they are concerned about keeping as the face of America and, and who would destroy that. And um, if Elizabeth or Megan can speak to that, that would be wonderful. Sure, um, I can start. It's, it's really not an accident. I don't think that all this is happening at a time when um, the country is becoming increasingly secular. I mean, I'm looking at macro trends about what's happening. Uh, and there is, great anxiety among white Protestant conservative Christian America uh, that the nation as they have wanted to perceive it is changing. I mean, I remember last year doing a story in Iowa um, in the town where you may remember uh, from, this is a throwback now, but when uh, then candidate Trump um, gave a speech and he said he would shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. And so I went back to that community and what many of us didn't hear uh, or didn't, what didn't get focused on that day was he, he also, I mean, it's an entirely uh, white Christian community. And he went, he's speaking at a Christian college and he said, it basically, if you vote for me, Christianity will have power again in America. And I remember, you know, we're talking about um, trafficking. One of the women that I went back to interview, you know, I was talking to people about 
what drew them to to the former president and she one of the things she brought up you know we were talking about all kinds of things you know their, their town um what had an increasing uh, hispanic population to work at the the pork and dairy factories and farms that were there and she mentioned this the one of the women she mentioned how afraid she was to go shopping you know the main town was about an hour away where you could go to like target and she said, you know, she'd been seeing these things on Facebook about moms who were followed to their cars if they, when they were shopping at Target and people were going to, you know, come kidnap their children. And, you know, then it went right into, for her, the, the church's responsibility to protect children in, um, in, you know, from sexual harm. And, you know, she didn't see herself in my, I mean, I'm not sure where she is now, but at the time she didn't see herself as I'm a Q supporter. It wasn't like that. It, these things are very subtle and uh, it makes it really hard to take a look at what is actually happening because some, what people say is going on, it, it kind of masks these big, huge forces that um, are beyond any one person. It's just not as direct all the time as I saw this post on Facebook and it, um, you know, I now believe this conspiracy theory. It's this whole web of things. Um, and, you know, that, that, that comment has struck with me. I mean, I, then I remember interviewing another woman in East Tennessee. Uh, this was much more recent. This was like uh, after the election results were final, but then President Trump um, did not accept them. And she lived in an entirely uh, Trump, Trump County, East Tennessee. And she said, you know, I, I, I'm like, so struck at what's happening to my kid. You know, she, she was trying to make sense of it all because it just was, it's very hard to comprehend, but she said, my kid is running, you know, nine-year-old kid running around our yard, pointing out trees that he could cut down in the event of a civil war to protect our house. And I thought in that moment, oh my goodness. I mean, we have like, we have we have this next generation that is picking up um, what what they're hearing. I, I, you know, I think schools are open there during the pandemic. Um, they're hearing parents of their friends talk about it. They're hearing teachers talk about this stuff. And I've also been reflecting on how we're twenty years after nine eleven this year. I don't know how students. I don't, I'm not going to do the math right now of, of students, the kind of people were, weren't alive on 9-11. Okay. Okay. So it's not going to make you feel good. It's not going to make me feel good. But um, one of the like interesting things to keep in mind is that 9-11, which was um, a foreign terror attack on American soil, um, happened right after a, this time of a, um, election unrest in the United States. And, you know, I, I was just thinking about how 20 years later, we are in a similar situation of this political unrest. And then we had a siege on the Capitol, which is an attack from within. And uh, it's going to, you know, it's easier to think about the enemy as what is other. Um, but- Although, Oh, let's, let's definitely nuance that a yeah. little bit because the conversation around 9-11 and the, a lighting of like Islam and the enemy is a, a thing that we would want to unpack a little bit. Sorry. Yeah, no, it is. And the, um, which is interesting, you know, I, it, that in that way, it would make you say, okay, like, are we really in a stage of Christian extremism now? Like you, ha it's, it's really complicated. Like which, how do you unpack all of these things? What is the relationship between belief and um, violence? Like uh, what are like, I think these are these are the kinds of questions that we're going to be talking about, not just this year, but like this is the next this is a new phase for the country and how we talk about this. Yeah, I want us to be really careful about tying belief and action together again, um, and particularly belief in violence, because it's it sounds like and I'm not saying, Elizabeth, obviously that you're saying this, but one of the things I see students struggle with is okay, I have no training in religious studies. I might not have grown up in a religious family at all, but holy book says X, so people do Y. And it's, I'm saying to students again and not to Elizabeth because I know she knows this, it's so, so much more complicated than that. So looking at 
how we think about religion and why people do the things they do, I get really nervous when we want to tie belief to how people act, particularly because thinking about religion as belief is a really Christian way to think about religion. Um, but rather than get dug into that, there were some things in the chat about people still being confused about what Q is and definitions are important. So I wanted to circle back on that. We're talking about Q. Uh, it's not a group like the clan where people sign membership cards and you go to meetings. It's a, it is a spider web of spaces online, most of which you have to really work to access, although a lot of it is on Facebook too purporting that there's secret knowledge coming from somebody really close to former President Trump about taking the country back. It is a, a movement that is tied to white Christian nationalism, but there are a number of folks who participate in Q who wouldn't necessarily identify themselves as evangelical or Christian. Uh, the reason that reporting like what Elizabeth has been doing, where you're talking about how central white Christianity is to this movement is because this is complicated. Uh, if folks have questions, feel free to ask them. But it's it's not just that people who say that they are white Christian are doing this thing. The way that whiteness has been constructed in the United States since before there was a United States comes out of a Christian way of thinking and of being in the world. So you don't necessarily have to identify as Christian to be shaped by Christianity and to be shaped by a particular kind of what's now white Christianity. So assumptions around what's good, what's moral, what kind of sex you should be having, what our country should look like very much comes out of a Christianity that helped construct how we understand whiteness in this country. And the point that Elizabeth has made a number of times, which is so important, is that this is not fringy. It's not out in the margins. White Christian supremacy has been central in what's now the United States since before there was a United States. And when we're saying white supremacy, I think it's important to hear not just, not just Proud Boys, although obviously Proud Boys, not just the Klan, although obviously the Klan, but this assumption that whiteness is the norm, whiteness is uh, it shouldn't even have to be talked about as race, right? This is just other people have race. Race is for not white people uh, in the same way that when we talk about who has gender, we don't often talk about men, strangely. Gender studies classes tend to be a lot about not men. So when we're looking at how a group like, how a movement like Q comes together, it's really important not just to pay attention to what they're saying about themselves, but uh, as Julie brought up, where they're getting their ideas, right? How uh, mainstream understandings of America and the right way to be in the world really borrow from very mainstream understandings of Christianity. This is so important and thanks for circling back around just to um, clarify the um, Q phenomenon and of course that the letter Q comes from the still anonymous person who is the source of postings that get endlessly um, read and dissected and studied for the clues that will right. lead people to a truth beyond the truth, a yes. truth beyond the reality. Yeah, it's that, a big white racist treasure hunt. Yeah. That, that yes, and that goes to, you know, Elizabeth's characterization of sort of how um, good it can feel to know that there is a reality beyond the reality. It makes, um, it makes one feel like, you know, you're being in on something and, um, and es especially informed and, you know, the government and the news media and the liberal elites are not trustworthy, neither are the professors in the universities. And so, um, with all of that, you know, whom do you trust? Well, there's this community that's, you know, dissecting and critically interpreting um, these posts from Q, and they do give, you know, the real picture, so Q and honors believe, of what's happening and what will happen in the United States. And, um, and with that, I wonder if if you know the actual beliefs of Q are, you know, so diffuse and mainstream in the United States, and 
um, certainly many of us, our families, our friends, people we, we respect have at this point um, encountered Q and some have become um, Q believers as well. Um, how should we think about continuing to try to have a collective conversation um, with these two different realities going on? Is there any way, if it's not really about what people believe, is there any way to intersect with what is happening in a productive way? One thing that I learned from Jeff Charlotte's reporting was that, you know, the vaunted critical thinking of the university is not necessarily going to help either because Q anoners are very happy about critical thinking or what they understand to be the careful parsing and reading and, um, and hermeneutics that goes on about the Q posts themselves. That is what they like to do. That's a grand puzzle. And part of the community of figuring out what's going on is the pleasure of critically unpacking Q posts. Yeah. Well, it's a research-based movement, right? It's just that we as a country have fundamentally undermined what counts as evidence, what counts as fact for the last, uh, what, 50, 75 years. So yeah, it leaves us in a rough spot, I think. So Michael Schulson just posted, posted a, a really great article at Undark, uh, which is a religion and science, or it's really a science uh, magazine that's open to religious studies uh, conversations. Um, and he just talked to a bunch of um, experts around things like brainwashing and deprogramming and what do I do, right? This is this is the number one question that, that I get, and I'm sure Elizabeth gets this a lot too, of the like, my uncle, whatever, has been brainwashed into Q, and what do I do? And that's such a human question, and that's such a human impulse, and scholars are exactly the wrong people to ask that question, because we're going to want to talk to you about like systems, and just <sighs> don't platform hate at home is, is what I think I can say to you. I can't say there's a right thing to like snap people out of it because they're not brainwashed. They made shitty choices about the media that they want to consume. I cursed at your students, sorry, Julie, but they did. And you can't, you can't push back at a conspiracy thinker without reinforcing their suspicion that they're doing the right thing, that they're on the right track, that they actually, they see the world in a clearer, better way than you do. It just, it reinforces it. So the only thing I can say, yeah, is don't, don't feed into it, don't engage it. If they're saying hateful things, disconnect from that person and hopefully they'll make different choices because they value that relationship. Um, in terms of how we study it, I'm really compelled by Carol Cusack's con um, theory of invented religions. So she's, this is, the book is a little dated now, it's like 20 years old, but she wants to pay attention to movements like uh, the Church of Pastafarianism and the Flying Spaghetti Monster or people who identify religiously as Jedis. Uh, which is a thing. And she says, like, the, the number one question that everybody wants to ask there is, do, like, do you really believe that you're a Jedi? Do, like, do you really believe that you're an elf? Do you really think there's a flying spaghetti monster? And her response to that is, who cares? What does it make possible to think this way? My, my go-to example is usually the, um, oh, sorry, the satanic temple. So do they really believe there's a Satan? Some do, some don't, who cares? What work are they doing in the world by saying you need to take our Satan-based religion as seriously as you take Christianity? If you make space for Christianity in public, we should be there too. If you're gonna put a 10 commandments up at the Capitol building, then we should get a Baphomet. If you're going to make religious exemptions for uh, Christian people to have access to certain uh, services, then my beliefs that I should have, say. Um, sorry, that I should have scientific based evidence for uh, exempting out of abortion restrictions should also be equally taken seriously. Um, lots of sources there. Satanic Temple is fascinating. And actually we have a podcast episode on it. So check out Keeping It One-on-One. But no, I think, I think the big question here is less, how, do they believe it? Do they not believe it? How do I make them stop believing it? And more like, A, 
pay attention to the conditions that make this kind of thought compelling to folks and uh, whether or not they believe it, what are they doing out in the world? I would just, I would just add to that. Um, I'm thinking about the way that even I think about religion reporting and what that is. And, you know, I, I can't, I can't, um, like offer specific guidance about what to do, uh, for your family member or friend who's in this. And, but the way that I've thought about it is it's about what kinds of questions we're asking. And, uh, so if, you know, if we're thinking about something like you, not just as belief, it's like, like we were saying, religion is not, not just about belief. It's almost like an entire, um, uh, it's an entire world. It's, you know, your, your ethnic background, your political environment, your generational history. Like, it's like, you are the product of all of these factors over time and all of these, um, re like realities that you don't choose. And so I've thought about, okay, let's look at what all of that is, um, and figure out what we can, learn about that, but then also what it's not. I mean, what are the, what, if that, if we, what we learn some things about who these people are and when, why these, um, where these beliefs are coming from based on those communities, it's like, okay, there, but there's this, we have to remember, there's a whole other side of this country. This country is big. This country is not entirely cute. I mean, uh, President Biden is in the White House right now. I mean, the I, I'm thinking even of the state of Georgia. I don't know if anyone here is from Georgia or has Georgia friends, but the uh, we forget. I mean, it, maybe we forget the day of the Capitol attack. Pretty sure it was that morning. Yeah. Uh, Senator Raphael Warnock of Ebenezer Baptist Church was uh, elected to the Senate, and Georgia was in the middle. You know, Georgia was at the center of a huge fight about. Uh, identity and white Christianity was like central to the attacks against him um, in the in his campaign um, and from his opponent, and he ran on a very overt black liberation theology message. And so, I think as we're staring into one part of the country, it's also important to look at these what else is happening um, and. Maybe if you can't talk to people in your family about Q, you can you can have uh, or create some room to at least yourself look into this other part of the country or figure out how that might become part of the kinds of conversations you have too. If I could um, pause this here and just um, signal to my colleagues who are helping in chat that we'll start to gather questions from chat and pose them to um, Elizabeth first and then to Megan. Um, Elizabeth might have to duck out because of a reporting deadline, but, um, but she will take some questions as well as um, us all staying together to talk a little bit more. And while we're doing that gathering to start, if I could ask Elizabeth, since you were there reporting um, at the time of the Capitol insurrection and um, presumably um, doing parts of the Biden inauguration as well, something very critical happened to the Q story at the moment of the Biden inauguration, which is that predictions that the prophecies of Q that Trump would triumph in his ascendancy as president, uh, even though Biden was elected, um, were dashed. Those prophecies were dashed. And there were a few days when Q message boards were full of people telling each other, we got had, we, we drank the Kool-Aid, we, oh. we need to bounce from this movement. But then the whole thing as Megan ref uh, referred to sort of righted itself, righted itself with, you know, a, a, a new set of conspiracy, conspiracy theories about, you know, what really happened, like events only really fed into the continuance of Q. And I just wondered what you see as the future of Q, if you can 
make a prophecy yourself. It, mm. it, did, do that. <laughs> it, it did have, it did have a great disappointment on the day of the Biden inauguration, but then again, um, and, and it has been deplatformed to some extent. It's no longer as available on Twitter or Facebook because of the social media companies, um, uh, uh, deplatforming many Q accounts, although not thoroughly. And um, and so communication is driven more underground and is harder to access. Does that mean that with, with the great disappointment and deplatforming that it will die down or is something else going to happen? We're all gonna go vegetarian. That's, sorry, that's a seven day Adventist joke. Take more religion classes. Sorry, Elizabeth, go ahead. My My short answer to that is no. Um, I mean, I guess you could ask, are we at the end of something or the beginning of something? And maybe we don't know the answer to that, but, um, you know, it, it wasn't just, you know, specific Q believers who were disappointed with the actual inauguration of president Biden. I mean, lots of, um, charismatic pastors, like the whole prophetic movement, um, and many, there were, my colleague, Ruth Graham did a great story about, um, you know, prophets who are apologizing for um, things that didn't come true about President Trump uh, and their followers got mad at them about this. I, because it, it's just so much bigger than just an idea system. Um, and I can't stress enough how great the disillusionment is in that part of the country. I mean, I'm a, we're also hearing things about, um, I, was, I'm, I can't remember the exact date, but I, I the prophecy, even the specific Q prophecies aren't over. I mean, people are predicting that X and such is going to happen with President Trump al allegedly returning to office and like in March or something. I mean, there's, there's always going to be things like this. Um, and I certainly, the anger about feeling, um, feeling loss and feeling like they were cheated out of something that they thought was supposed to be so real is not, that is not going anywhere. My, my experience reporting is actually that people are much stronger in their beliefs um, now than they may even have been before. I mean, I, I'm looking at what, what is, what is the 2024 presidential race going to be like? Oh God. Right. Right. Were there questions for um, Elizabeth from chat that um, that um, Santiago wants to help us pose? Thanks so much. Yes, for sure. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for having an active conversation uh, in the chat. Let me just start with a few questions. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to identify some students. First question, what role does Joe Biden play in theory? Uh, and the second one uh, could be, what, what is the educational level of the Q followers? Uh, it's not assigned to anyone in particular. So if either uh, either either one can answer, it would be great. I think um, you know Q Q people are kind of all over the spectrum economically. If that I think that was the question. I mean, the real professionals, uh, people with advanced degrees, people who didn't go to didn't finish high school. I mean, so that's really all over the place. And uh, I think with the, if there's a con it, if there's something wild about uh, President Biden, it's, you could probably imagine that Q has some kind of um, very specific, I mean, there, there's, I, I don't know that I wanna like name all of them here, um, but I certainly during the campaign, there were all kinds of um, allegations and unfounded accusations about um, his intelligence, his mental capacity for office. Um, but these things get, they get to be pretty elaborate. And it's actually one of the things I, I think about when we talk about Q is how much do you, do you really want to give platform, like give, give voice to their um, outlandish ideas. I mean, it's sensational and it's interesting, but it's um, for me, it's like we've been saying, it's, it's kind of besides the point, unless it's something that, you know, is potentially going to become violent and we need to pay attention to it, right? There is, um, there could be a real danger for that. I think one of the things, 
Oh, sorry, Julie, just one of the things that I think is interesting about Q and other white nationalist movements in the 21st century, and I learned this from Kelly J. Baker, who if y'all are on Twitter, you should be following her. Elizabeth actually did a really great interview with her not that long ago. Uh, so she wrote a book called Gospel According to the Klan, where she talked about how mainstream the theology of the Klan was at the beginning of the 20th century. The Klan is a coherent movement right? Like you join, there are stated beliefs. I'm seeing a lot of kind of chatter in the chat about like, okay, but what do they believe? And it's not, as Elizabeth's pointing out, coherent in that way. It is a mishmash of all sorts of uh, largely white nationalists, but not only white nationalist beliefs about how the country should run. It is a rapidly like anti-Catholic movement that also has Catholic participants in it. It is a movement that uh, has people that hate religion that are also participating in these like very Christianized rituals. There's not one coherent like checklist of things that makes you Q or not Q. What we do see is this horrible, disgusting Rice Krispie treat of racism positioning itself against specific religions. So there's an anti-Catholic movement, but particularly we see a real just and hard to watch anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim uh, sentiment and action come out of it to the extent that you know we are seeing Camp Auschwitz t-shirts on the Capitol grounds during this. So rather than there being like a coherent internal religious white Christian identity, we see a positioning against other religions as inherently, sorry, I'm getting like a lot of hands, other religions as inherently un-American. So the imagining of Judaism or of Islam, or again, depending on your, your uh, perspectives, of even Catholicism as inherently anti-American and something that Q pushes back against. Thank you very much. The easy question is how we can discuss about Guanon uh, without amplifying its, its false claims. That certainly goes to yeah. what Elizabeth was saying. You know, how much do you want to list exactly what is believed? And one thing that um, that occurred to me about Joe Biden in particular. Um, without specifying much is that, you know, his closeness to uh, President Barack Obama and his closeness to um, the Clintons, both of whom are super subjects of Q conspiracies as well, really enfold Biden into that whole same liberal elite cabal that is allegedly undermining Trump and undermining the direction of America as it should go. Elizabeth, did you want to say more about that? Just that this, this question is something we actually talk a lot about and how we do our work um, as journalists, because we think about things like what should go in a headline? I mean, do you call out specific names of even of rioters or do you name um, the channels that the, do you, the, the, these conversations are happening on? I mean, do you link to them? Most of the time the answer is no. I mean, we're very, very careful. I mean, we have a, a whole team of people who specifically think about these questions and what will be responsible because it's also important that we tell our readers what is true and what is happening um, so that we we know. Um, uh, but it it's just the idea that you would just um, say something because you can is, is also just not not how we do it, so. Just a little media, media insight there. I, I also want to add that I think there's an impulse, and it, again, very human, very human reaction to want to know more about these folks that see the world in such a different way. But usually, it's coming from a place of concern about Q having undue influence on family members, people we love, right? And maybe if I learn more, that will help me explain to them why they shouldn't be doing this. And that's just. Unfortunately, that is that is not how people work. Like learning more about Q is not going to make people stop, or frankly, start being involved in Q. Um, just in the same way that we we look at attempts to to dismantle and disrupt Islamophobia, right? More information about Islam doesn't actually make people stop being Islamophobic. So, yeah, I, I think there's a real danger in like naming the channels that you should go look for if you wanted to learn more about this. Because um, it, it just, I think it invites a curiosity without offering any sort of material solution. 
Thank you very much. There is a question about media, uh, especially how, uh, how, whether or not Fox News play, play a role in push, pushing theories, supporting Q theories. Our Fox News in particular, media in general. That speaks to Megan's um, um, swear word about <laughs> swear word about choosing media, but um, but Elizabeth, you know, bef before I know you might have to bounce soon, but just to ask how um, how you know the Times is seeing itself, for example, on the landscape of media that treat this topic, and um, there are decisions of your company, but then there are decisions of other companies as well. And um, that's a whole exploding landscape too. Yeah, I think it's important. We're talking about all the factors that are going on during this time in this country uh, from economic crisis to political unrest. We're also in um, a several decades long period, period of disruption in terms of how we communicate information about who gets to control news. Uh, and what what that even is. Um, we have the digital revolution happening. And I, uh, I am so impressed. I mean, I can just speak to the New York Times, but I am so impressed at my team of colleagues who are working harder than you'll probably ever know, trying to get to the bottom of truth and reality. Uh, so that one of the, I just think about um, at its best, you know, one of my goals is as a journalist is to do all of this legwork about reporting and figuring out what is true and what is helpful for the, the public to know because people don't have time to, not everyone can be a professional journalist. Uh, and this erosion of trust um, in the media is a significant challenge. I mean, I, and I, I don't, I can't say where the country is going to end up on that. All that we can do really is focus on getting the best, you know, truest version of the truth that we can and continue to refine that. Um, stories are bigger than any one article. It's the body of work, um, which is why I would leave you all with encouragement to um, either subscribe to the news or um, check out, you know, check out through the library resources. Um, to look at it as a collective instead of just that one viral thing that's bouncing around on your timelines. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. We have tons and tons of, um, of journalism and communications majors as well as religion majors here on uh, the Zoom, I know, plus my whole class from religion and media and religion and politics and everyone basically has some tie into what you're saying and what you're trying to do. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the combo. Very much so. Thanks. Good luck with your story. Thanks. And thanks so much to my colleagues for um, continuing to look through chat and get us a few questions um, that, um, that Megan and all of us can discuss. Great. Uh, just in terms of the Fox News piece, uh, Fox News has absolutely been an active and frankly uh, malevolent presence in the American media landscape for the last several many decades um but it's been interesting in the last four years to watch fox news not even be radical or conservative enough for a lot of the q folks so you see again news trading happening on parlor 4chan 8chan reddit all of those spaces uh shifting to looking at stuff like oan um which claims to be a, a news outlet that's cute uh yeah it just again the what gets to be marketed as news has been fundamentally undermined, honestly, since the 1970s, and certainly in the last 20 to 30 years. I think it's important, though, to understand that people make choices to consume media. Fox News is a steaming pile of garbage trash. At the same time, it is not Fox News's fault that many people we love choose to consume that garbage trash. They are adult humans who are making choices to watch news that is unabashed in its political commitments. And I feel like we need to hold, nay, I know we need to hold people who choose to consume that garbage trash accountable for their actions because they are adult humans with agency. Thanks so much. And um, just, to, just to sort of go back to something else you were saying, Megan, which is that people want quick solutions to these things. Yeah. 
people want quick solutions to human trafficking, want mm-hmm. quick solutions to sex abuse, want quick solutions to fake news and the alternative reality of the Q phenomenon. And there aren't quick solutions. So on the one hand, to hold adult humans with agency accountable for their media consumption choices. On the other hand, where do you put the part about, there are whole systems that are failing masses of people. Yes. And the solutions don't come from turning on or off Fox News. Can you say more about that? Sure. None of it's going to be satisfying, but sure. I will say more things about that. Again, we need systemic change and people want individual fast answers, right? So my book is about child sex abuse and when it happens in religious contexts and people want to blame minority religions for sex abuse happening. They want to pretend like it's unusual. They don't want to hear, hey, we set up every system possible to make this something that happens everywhere, right? So if we want to address something like a QAnon, we want to address something like just media illiteracy. I mean, the big zoom back is we need to start with capitalism and just dismantling that. But in a in a shorter term solution, uh, we need systemic change around what's allowed to be put on the airwaves, right? There need to be penalties for lying in public, not not individual people lying in public, you, you know, free speech. First Amendment, we like that one. But if you are a corporate entity using the airwaves, there should be penalties for providing disinformation, right? And unfortunately, the system that we have set in place to enforce those penalties is one that is deeply compromised and frankly has capitalized on QAnon and other conspiracy thought again for for decades. So yeah, I don't I don't know if this is fixable, but if it is fixable, it has to start bigger than turn off Fox News. It does have to start with things like hold an OAN, a Fox News, any of these things accountable when they make armed insurrection against the government possible and seem attractive. Santiago, any other questions to lob? Uh, I think there are two questions I would like to connect. One is, uh, it was some talks about making adults uh, accountable for what they do, but what do we do with children and teenagers who are, uh, and I call Caitlin here, buying into these ideas? Uh, and there is someone else asking, I have someone very close to me who uh, it has been um, it has been involved. Uh, how do we do? How do we deal with this? Yeah, again, I don't have satisfying answers for that. My my personal answer is I deplatforming starts at home. And if people are going to be hateful, I, you need to be very clear that you are not going to participate in that. You're not going to make space for that to just air as, oh, we're having an opinion. We're not talking about differences of opinions. We're not talking about like both sides of the story. When one side of the story, once the other side of the story did, mm-hmm. when one side of the story showed up at the Capitol with freaking nooses and took panic buttons out of Ayanna Presley's office. I think we need to stop pretending that there's merit in entertaining all ideas when some of those ideas are homicidal, if not genocidal. Uh, may I ask you, I think there's an important question Dino asked here. He said he's confused on how the system of capitalism is related with QAnon and other white nationalist programs. I think okay, that's well, an I'll important start... point to, yeah. It, no, that's an important is. point to at least give some hints to it. Sorry, no, 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 absolutely. I'm sorry, I said that off the bat, but also I really do mean it. Um, capitalism is a system that values profit over people. Capitalism is a genocidal system that will bleed us all dry and wants us all dead if it means corporations can continue to earn. The reason that it's specifically relevant here, though, is that the Supreme Court of the United States ruled truly not that long ago and under Obama that corporations are people who are at (laughs) corporations. I can't even say it without with, with a straight face, but it's true. Corporations are people, A, and then several years later, corporations are people who are entitled to religious freedom. So we see this uh, devaluing of human lives, of human freedoms in favor of profit 
and in favor of systems that maximize profit. The reason that QAnon has the space that it does now, the reason, frankly, that we saw a siege on the Capitol to begin with is not just because racism, although obviously also because racism, but because we have made white supremacy profitable in the United States. It profits on networks like Fox News, on OAN, on Infowars. Again, do I care that Alex Jones believes or does not believe that you know frogs are making us gay? I do not. What I care about is his t-shirt sales and how much money he makes saying that stuff. QAnon works in this country because it turns people a profit. And if we're gonna talk about who profits off QAnon most, I'm sorry, but we need to start with Mark Zuckerberg because he has made billions off not regulating all of this hate speech. And that's how I feel about capitalism and also Facebook. Thank you for asking, Santiago. My pleasure. Okay, and thank you for the answer. Okay, uh, I am trying to see. Uh, there is a question on trying to extend that a little bit more and think about, you know, the relation with uh, not only with capitalism but also with colonial Christianity. Yes. We Sorry. Yes. Let's more? absolutely talk about that. Here's the thing, and I'm I'm going to be this person again, but we have limited time, so let me just gesture toward the fact that I have a podcast with Elise Morgenstein first at UVM. She's hilarious. We love her. And we have talked about all of these issues extensively. Last season was specifically about the intersections of race, gender, and religion, both in what's now the United States, which is my part, and globally. When we're thinking about white colonial Christianity in the United States, that is, those are not separate words. We literally build whiteness in this country out of colonial Christianity. There is not, this is, again, I know you're undergrads and not everybody has had a chance to have classes in all of this. So you're gonna have to take my word for it, but I promise we have receipts on the podcast. When Europeans- and religion classes. And also please take the religion classes. <laughs> take all of the religion classes. Um, good call, Julie, I like it. Uh, so when colonial, European colonial uh, forces come to what is now the United States and take all of the land from the people who are already living here and forcibly transport and enslave people from the Caribbean and from the continent of Africa. They are not justifying that on the basis of race because race as we understand it doesn't exist until really the 17th, 18th century. What they have are religious differences. It is okay in European colonizers mind to enslave and try to wipe out native people and people we would now think of as black because they are different religiously. They are heathens, they, they are pagans, they're not Christians is the important part. But as I'm sure you probably know, with that uh, taking of all the land and with that forcible enslaving also came, to, uh, came to, wow, whew, also came forcible conversion to Christianity. And then how do you make sense of slavery and genocide if the people that you're enslaving and genociding are also Christian? This is where we see truly the construction of whiteness. This is how white people, people we now think of as white, come to think of themselves as white and come to think of other people as black, as native, as Latinx, et cetera. Uh, there's a long history here. I will just say, if you have not looked at Catherine Gerbner's work, she wrote a great book about Christian slavery. Uh, she also has some blog posts if you don't want to read a whole book about it. Um, but we cannot think about whiteness in this country without thinking about race. We can't think about, I'm sorry, we can't think about whiteness in this country without thinking about religion. We cannot think about religion in this country without thinking about race. And specifically, we can't think about 20th or sorry, 21st century politics in the, in the United States without thinking about race and religion and specifically white Christian supremacy. And again, I don't just mean the Klan, I don't just mean the Proud Boys, what I mean is the privileging at every single conceivable level, whiteness and Christianity, even when we don't even think of it as Christianity anymore. So when the Supreme Court makes judgments about who can adopt, who can get a freaking birthday cake, wedding cake, etc., the Supreme Court doesn't do that as a religious body, but it is absolutely drawing on specific Christian thinking that also privileges whiteness at every conceivable turn. So again, just when we're saying religion and politics and race in this country, please understand that as one big word and not three separate concepts. Thank you very much. Um, Julie, do you see Professor Byrne, do you see anything else? 
definitely, I have um, tons of questions still. And uh, th thanks so much, um, Megan, for keeping with us. Thanks for everyone who's um, who's um, continuing to just be part of this um, thoughtful conversation. I wonder, um, um, Megan, if if there is a uh, um, a way in which you could help us to put uh, put QAnon in a continuity with other things that you do study. I would love um, that. There are there are continuities that yes. scholars have put together with um, new religious movements, with um, conspiracy theories um, and their history in the U.S., with um, apocalypticism, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, and um, and and also Elizabeth mentioned the the new technology. Is this, mm. is this a technological movement as well that is syncing with, you know, as you described, social media platforms like Facebook in very particular ways? So, you know, if there's not big picture satisfying solutions to how to fix this, what are big picture connections to help us understand and learn more. Yeah. Not learn more from Q posts and going to find them, but to learn more. Sure. I think it's really important, and this again syncs with what Elizabeth was saying, to understand that QAnon is not new. It is not a new religious movement. It is in fact the, I have understood it as the absurd but logical conclusion of the emergence of the new Christian right in the 1970s. And I have colleagues who would want to take it back further to the 1950s, but I get twitchy before 1979. So let's, let's just assume that uh, I'm right for the purposes of this conversation. And think about this turn in the 1970s where largely white, overwhelmingly Christian, interestingly Catholic for the first time in American history, thinking comes from all of these different uh, denominations and platforms and places and organizations to form one coherent political movement that we now think of as the new Christian right, which then becomes the moral majority the lines between those are a little fuzzy. What we see is an articulation of a specific kind of white Christianity as not just moral, but as uh, national values. It's not just this is how you be a good Christian, it's this is how you be a good American. And that is, if you know anything about Reagan, written all over every single public speech he gives for the entirety of his disaster of an eight year presence in presidency. So what we see uh, come out of the new Christian right is this idea of America looks a certain way. It is it is white. It is straight. It is uh, it is absolutely capitalist. It has some but not too many children. I get all in, into this in my book, and I also yell about it on Twitter on the regular. So if you want to ask me questions, not here. I'm at MPG PhD on Twitter. Way too much. So okay, we've got the new Christian right. And then in the 1980s, we also see the emergence of the satanic panic, which also has a lot to do with Reagan, but we don't have that kind of time. We see a national panic about dark forces. We're not calling them Democrats at this point, but like mm, uh, abusing children for Satan. Um, this comes out of anxieties about white families outsourcing childcare out of their homes. Um, it also comes out of new turns in psychology and law enforcement, but basically we have the whole country really scared for about 10 years that the forces of darkness are trying to pervert and abuse and kill our children. And for a big swath of the country, honestly, that anxiety never went away. This, the QAnon stuff that we're seeing now is directly traceable. It's not like, oh, it came back. For a lot of folks, it never left. And so seeing this both anxiety around children, this conviction that people who disagree with me politically must be aligned with literal Satan, yeah, is, is nothing new in the last 50 years. And honestly, there are ways that we could trace that back much, much further. I saw somebody in the chat talk about like, why is it always the Jews? Because Europe, when we're looking at European history, is so freaking Christian, right? If you are not Christian, you must be the enemy. You must, when I construct you as the enemy, be sexually suspect. You must be hostile toward children. You must want to undermine the state. So in some ways, what we're seeing in Q is this extreme and what feels like a novel 
manifestation, but in another way, it's like, man, they have been doing this stuff for as long as we have written records. And, and, and which children, you know, very particularly mm. that, that the you white know, women and children, one of the hashtags of Q posts is often, um, keep the children safe, or save the children, yeah, save the children, which and is like an outgrowth of believe the children from the 1980s, right? Sure. It just, yeah, which, which, you know, go, goes to what you're describing in, you know, the moment of the late 1970s when, mm-hmm. Um, more white women um, had to um, take jobs outside the home yep. and anxiety about white children yep. being cared for by other people's, um, uh, by, by other other families in daycare centers, mm-hmm. um, you know, zoom up to the present moment where, you know, some children are the tremendous concern of QAnon people, but other children who are in cages at the border. They're facilities now, Julie. We're calling them facilities now. They're not in cages anymore. It's facilities. They're nicer painted, so it's fine. This is sarcasm. This is my sarcasm voice. Yes, yes, exactly to what you're saying. And again, not in any way specific to QAnon. We as a country are really bad at caring for actual children. We love conceptual children. We want to protect conceptual children forever. But when it comes to things like, hey, actual alive children need to not be in cages. They need to eat. They need clean drinking water. Suddenly, this is too much to ask. Or if we're specifically concerned about, again, the prevention of child sex abuse, we love to freak out when it is this specter looming. But when you say, hey, this child is being harmed, you need to address this as a community, then it is too far. And in fact, even the mention, even the suspicion of, or the accusation of child sex abuse becomes too great to, to consider. And it's better just to not say anything at all. We just, we, we do a really bad job of taking care of actual children in this country. And it's frustrating that we see that impulse to protect kids, which is very human, which comes out of the best things of us, not be mobilized to protect actual children, but to do a moral posturing that makes us feel good and doesn't actually change the lives of actual children for the better. I've seen you um, quote, and I'll shout out my colleague, Dr. Ann Berline, who yes. is um, with us. I've seen you shout out her book too. And Raise High the Cross. I think of that one all the time. She says, sorry to cut you off, but I do really love this book. It's all over my dissertation, where yeah. she says that some of the, the worst things that humans do come out of the best impulses that they, even even this kind of rioting with with QAnon, I I I would never tell someone that they're not actually there to save their kids or their family. They think that they are, but it's also why I don't want to talk about their beliefs because who cares what they think if they're doing actual harm to actual humans? Very much so. As you all can see, and as um, Dr. Goodwin, as well as um, Ms. Diaz said numerous times, um, there are no e- easy answers here. And that's disappointing, but I do trust that gathering to have a discussion, gathering to try to find some clarification and give some historical context and and argue and go back and forth and have the frisson of intellectual conversation um, does take us each into our communities with thinking more and um, knowing more. And um, if you want more of that, go to any class in the religion department or Jewish studies at Hofstra and lots of the other classes that are available in all the universities I see represented, as well as the departments across Hofstra. Um, I hope lots of people do um, uh, follow Elizabeth in her reporting. I hope a lot of people sign on to check out um, Dr. Goodwin's podcast, Keeping It 101, and also her Twitter feed is just a wealth (laughs) of information and humor and sarcasm and all the good things that make discussing things like this bearable. Um, Her book, Abusing Religion, is also just making waves with its sophistication about um, talking about about how religion abuses and also how we abuse the idea of religion 
it's just wonderful stuff. So um, with that, thanks again to everyone who has participated in the conversation, helped today, co-sponsored today, my colleagues who have been helping with chat, um, all the students whose, uh, whose, whose flurries of chats I can see are just taking us new places. And um, most especially as we um, say thank you to Dr. Megan Goodwin of Northeastern University. Um, have a wonderful day, everyone. Yes, we can do a actual <laughs> unmuted clap. Thank you, thank you, yes, yes. And everyone have a wonderful um, rest of your day. Appreciate your being here. Thanks so much. Peace out. Is there a way to get a copy of the chat? There are a bunch of questions from folks and I... Yes, let me see if I can actually just save one right now. Atheline, can you save a chat? Yes, I, I can. I'll, I'll get it in the recording. That would be great. That would be great. Thanks, Atheline. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Stay healthy and safe. You too. Ah, thank you very much for handling um, all of that. Appreciate it. I know lots of my students are looking forward to um, seeing the recording who couldn't be here right now. Oh, okay. that. that was so many people. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, 274 at the highest point. Wow. <laughs> That's great. It, it is great. great. Uh, literally, I, I think this is one event that everyone that signed up actually showed up because in a lot of Zooms, there's like a 20% drop off, but everyone came in. That's tremendous. Good to hear. Good to hear. Okay. I have found the chat. Someone in the chat told me how to save it. So I have saved oh, that too. Okay. Thank great. You. Just, I got a bunch of DMs and they're like, I can't, <laughs> I'm happy to see people and also I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Thank you everyone so great. much. Wow. Wonderful. Um, do you need anything else from me? Or are we good? No, we're good. Okay, thank you all so much. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Take Megan. Care. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks I'll for having me. Later. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. Take care. Okay. Good night, everyone. Bye.